Who are Muslim brothers and sisters? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. And what a morning it Honestly. is at the moment. The heavens just opened up. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't forget my name, can I? I'm changing. My name. <laughs> just take it as blessings, really. Just the rain here in Lagos is heavy. I'm kind of you. And I just hope that it's the same, especially on all arable lands in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm Ayo Makinde. Welcome to the show. Well, good morning from Abuja. It's sunny and dry here. I'm Mount Pai Ogun Yusuf. Oh, dear. Uh, you're missing. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, wow. you, you, you'll get your lot. You'll get your lot. We have to wade through it. <laughs> you know how it is when, uh, I think it was the uh, meteorological agency that said we're going to receive a lot more rains mm. this year mm. than we have ever in, in recent times. So we need to brace up for that. Uh, COVID-19 or not, and the that's, that, that's to scary sure. to me, sincerely. Mm -hmm. That's scary to Why? me. So on the one hand, we're battling COVID-19, mm -hmm. an, an international, you know, malaise. On the other hand, we still have to contend with high volume of rainwater, mm -hmm. which we had, when, even when things were okay, we had a tough time combating. Well, I, I think the good <laughs> thing, well, one of the good things is the fact that water usage should have dropped to an extent. So, I mean, you shouldn't have a lot of water spilling into those channels. So maybe at the end of the day, we'll have the water levels rising as much. But hey, don't take it from me. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it from, take it from the experts. <laughs> okay. Um Sunrise Daily. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, uh, get across to Professor Ibekwe, who joins us from our studios in Abuja. Good morning, Professor. Thank you for joining us this morning. But there's a recent perspective of what, uh, where we want to pick this up from. Yes, the event you saw, yeah, uh, happened previously. But Professor, thank you once again for joining us this morning. Well, first of all, let's get your impression about our approach to tackling COVID-19. Yes, there's a lot being said about tests. There's a lot being said about the testing facility, our capacity. What's your assessment of how this is playing out so far? Um, you know, um, COVID-19 is a pandemic and um, there are laid out guidelines and um, uh, steps that are expected to be taken in order to be able to contain this disease um, of which i can say that uh, ncdc they're following the right guideline um because um one key step here is to ensure that uh, initially as we apply the lockdown is to have everything as much as possible the spread of the disease uh, you know, stabilized and contained at that level uh, to limit spread. But uh, lockdown on its own is uh, um, is an is a means to an end rather than an end to on its own. That's why you've been seeing several modifications of the lockdown uh, because the when you're trying to handle the pandemic, the disease itself, you also look on the other side. It has to be a balance because this is a disease of both uh, nature and nurture. So tackling the disease and handling the economic impacts are all very important. So once this is done, then massive testing is uh, the only way that you'll be able to identify those um, who are actively infected and even those um, who are, quote unquote, uh, passively infected. Passive in the sense that they're all carriers and they're not manifesting the illness. So. Um, and this set of people must be identified. And the only way and the credible way of doing this is intensifying our testing capacity. And of course, um, good enlightenment program to ensure that we all abide by the ABCD rules that had to do with um, ways of uh, limiting the spread of this illness. It's very unfortunate that it has gotten to community transmission, which of course we know is another level and um, assuming that it was limited to uh, imported disease then, or on clusters as the case may be, that would have been a lot easier to handle. But we know that they have not gotten there yet because the testing capacity, even their target of uh, getting up to 2 million within a specified time, we know is a tall order. But with the advent of what is going on and the number of um, 
uh, facilities being opened up in the various countries. I think if we further expedite our efforts towards doing this and intensify efforts towards also passing the messages, you know, down to the populace in languages that they will understand, involving all the um, uh, all the agencies, uh, including the um, you know the opinion leaders in our various communities, to ensure that our populace abide, you know, by the simple rules of um, you know um, maintaining personal hygiene, keeping the physical distancing, you know, and also early reportage, trying to report whenever you have any of these uh, suggestive uh, symptoms of, of COVID-19. But the reality is that we have to increase our testing capacity. Beyond this, um, the panel system that we're using right now, that's the PCR, we know that uh, NCDC is planning to use alternative sources, which is going to help them. Uh, because once we're able to um, employ the gene expert uh, machines that are waiting for configuration, I understand we have nothing less than 400 of that. Okay, no, but, but let me just bring this in, so you might as well just respond to it as well while you uh, hold your train of thought. About the uh, successful validation of that uh, first phase of the RNA, which is going to help us in all of this, talk to us about that. How advantageous is that in this whole quest? Yeah, um, it's going to really be very, very useful. You know, um, the PCR machine and indeed setting up the standard laboratory um, is uh, is not an easy task. So to say, uh, it is time consuming. It is also resources uh, dependent. Uh, but the reality is that you utilize what you have on ground that you will find to also be useful and will give you representative results. And that is why, since um, we have these gene expert machines around, which has been tested by uh, authorities and found out to also be capable of giving a high level of sensitivity and specificity to the, you know, to the virus when we use it for testing. But that what is expected here is to configure these machines, you know, in such a way that they will be representative and be able to carry out these functions. So once this is done, it becomes easy because you will be able to now create more test centers across the country, you know, and um, especially in the epi, epi, um, the epi centers, uh, where we need really need to in intensify the, the the number of uh, you know test outlets available. We know now that even uh, we're taking the test down to the community level, so this will help us to be able to open more much more outlets. And we know that the HIV um, uh, machines that were used earlier on for um, the HIV projects in the country, it was also known that this could also be used for this if they are appropriately configured to fit into the system, how there will be uh, uh, if representative result. So all this will help because you don't really need now to deploy more resources, looking for more PCR machines, uh, uh, and the task of really deploying uh, a lot of uh, uh, funding and but, Prof, we, we also understand that uh, that uh, success is also going to help us in the production of uh, at least cheap test kits, which we can then deploy. But there are those who say, well, that may be a good thing. But the other question now is about us having a lot more test centers and developing our capacity, because the chances are if we begin to test more people, you may have more people who may be positive. You're absolutely correct here. It's not a may, it, it, is, it is real, because once you have community transmission, this becomes, uh, even, even those who, you know, who are carriers are capable of transmitting. And there is no way we know that those who are carriers will not manifest even with the disease, and they are capable of transmitting to people around them. So the onus is on us to up our games to ensure that uh, the testing capacity increases, because it is something that is time bound. The more we test, the more we're able to identify, you know, those who are positive, give them supportive therapy, and we're able to isolate them from others, then we're moving gradually to containing the disease. 
And uh, it's not until you get to the peak before you start talking of uh, the flattening the curve and having, you know, um, um, uh, having a decline and eventually getting to eradication. So all these are stepwise, all these are time bound. That's why uh, there's no alternative rather than expanding our frontiers towards much more testing capacity. And also each and every one of us, citizens being responsive to um, obeying the simple rules that will help to limit and contain uh, the transmission of, of this disease. Um, when you talk of uh, rapid kids, Rabbit kids, they have their own um, downside because the sensitivity and specificity is very, very, very. And that's why um, I'm aware that NCDC, uh, they just launched research grant, put it out there for people to assess, to help them in identifying, assessing rapid kids, that the sensitivity and specificity will be acceptable, good enough, and representative, so that we won't have uh, too many... Uh, uh, false negative or post, false positive results, because it's better to do qualitative uh, analysis and qualitative identification rather than doing wrong identification that will not help in containing the illness at the end of the day. So prevention, prevention, prevention is the key thing that should be the message to the society, each and every one of us. And of course, the authorities has to you know expedite their efforts uh, towards ensuring that we get to that level of desirable testing. There must be at least one test center in every state. We've been saying this all this long and happy that that is their target. But of course, in epicenters, there are new ones even coming up now, or your state, you know, recorded over 100 last time, all put together. So some of these states will have to also uh, look towards their direction in such state that you have very high um, case identification rate. We must have multiple test centers, you know, in, in, in such places. And um, um, when we do this, have massive deployment and cast our net very wide. So we'll be able to uh, identify those uh, who, who are infected, give them the supportive therapy needed, protect those who are not infected, and as much as possible, decontaminate our environment. Then we'll be talking of uh, uh, getting out of... Uh, Okay, now the, the question here will be, what is the guarantee that this will boost our testing capacity? And this is why I say this. About a month ago, the DG of NCDC put out a statement saying that well, we needed more RNA extraction kits. And he put out, you know, the different manufacturers. The day after, he said, well, it seems like we have gotten at least help from people. But if you look at our daily testing from that point until now, we have not even reached 2,000, which is, I mean, one of the early milestones we set for ourselves. Now we have moved on to saying we want to test millions. So that happened and it didn't, re it didn't quite increase our testing capacity. So what is the guarantee that yes, this, uh, the first phase has been done with NCDC has validated the extraction kit, but what is the guarantee that it will improve our testing capacity? You know, um, you, you, you can only gain when you add something on what is existing. So we know that already on ground, yeah, the, the PCR is one of the key, uh, is our ma major uh, mode of uh, testing for the COVID-19 and identifying positive cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, this, having this um, uh, phase two validation will add to the capacity. Although we know that, yes, it is true that the the reagents you need and um, the kits you need actually in carrying out these, they're not manufactured here in the country. But we still have to make effort in reaching out, you know. And um, But when we use gene expert, which is going to be like um, using multiple facets, that's not going to in any way stop what we're doing with uh, PCR. That will still be on. But you deploy gene expert, you deploy other methods of testing, then it's going to help. Uh, definitely, our testing capacity will have to increase. And um, effort is only when you source that you'll be able to get. So we expand our frontiers towards reaching out to how we'll be able to get um, uh, the necessary... Let me, let me put this... Uh, let me... I don't know if this is like rephrasing the same question about 
how our testing capacity will indeed increase. I also recall the DG of the NCDC saying when we put this same something, a similar question to him, said that we can only test the number of samples that we get. So the question then would be, how do we get to the point of having enough samples to test up to 20,000 per day, uh, you know, from what the uh, RNA Swift is being proposed that it can do uh, up to 50,000? How do we get so many uh, uh, samples per day to be tested. In other words, how do we deploy these uh, facilities that we have just um, discovered? Yeah, um, it's, it's actually we have to um, increase the number of uh, field uh, officers that we have, okay? And it's always good to get feedback, even from the populace on what is going on. And those who are out there are field workers, including those who are receiving information from the public, they have to be more active, have to open up more um, active information network communicating system. Because there's evidence that people would have made calls and waiting to be tested, you know, for days and nobody will turn up, you know. So these are the things. If you have more field officers, since we're beginning to enter into the community and even do door-to-door -door testing, I have more field uh, officers who go in there and take much more samples, you know, and return also uh, in a record time, because this is something that is time dependent, and make sure that the, communicating system, the communication system is very effective and efficient, so that as soon as information is received, as a matter of um, within the shortest possible time, you'll be able to get to such, um, you know, uh, calls and uh, have the samples taken. And of course, the hospitals, from our various hospital systems, we can use the hospitals as areas of taking the sample. Even if we don't have uh, the testing centers domicile in the various hospitals, samples could be taken from there and now transported to the various places that we have, you know, um, we have uh, the, 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 the the, the, the testing laboratories domiciled in. And of course, the field workers who have been going into the communities, you know, will intensify the effort, will increase the number, you know, and also ensure that um, the uh, information and channel of uh, communication flow is, is expedited. You know, I know that we may not be going to high forgotten things, but uh, in some places, drones have been using in transporting samples and all those, but we just have to look for an effective means of transportation in our own system here, of which I believe that if the field workers will concentrate on them, increase the number, ensure that they have efficient uh, transportation system to be able to reach out on time as at when due, take the samples and return back to the laboratories, uh, we'll be able to uh, make much more efforts. And of course, we know that it takes a lot of time to be able to complete testing on one sample. So the batching, if we have many more uh, outlets for testing, we'll be able to also, as this are coming, they'll be coming out in real time, the results. But by and large, we have to explore these two areas. The number of people that we have as field workers in the field who are going out and taking these samples. And of course, our communication transportation system towards um, uh, returning the sample as at when do, and then looking into our facilities, the hospitals, you know, from there we can also uh, take samples uh, from patients so that we use multiple approach in actually um, getting there and improving on what is already on ground. Now, there was something um, you said the other time that I think might also come in um, handy or rather important for us to address. The more we test, the more likely we will get higher positive uh, cases. That's what one of the things that you said earlier. And that also means that we'll have to put this on the same health infrastructure, the same health personnel that we have. How do you think we'll be able to manage that given our limitations as far as bed spaces are concerned, our limitations as far as healthcare workers are concerned, health uh, caregivers are concerned, and uh, all of that. How do you think that we'll be able to manage if we have a surge in positive cases? Yeah, um, you see, um, the 
COVID is a game changer. It has got to expose the weaknesses, especially in the healthcare system, not only in Nigeria, even across the globe. So um, we cannot fix uh, all the, the deficiencies that we have overnight. But all we can do is to build incrementally, you know, as, as, um, as uh, uh, being applied. So incrementally build on what is on ground. There are a lot of deficiencies. There's no doubt about that, you know. Uh, but the truth um, is, is that you, you, you walk um, tangentially towards as you're walking and you're doing assessment, you'll be seeing the loopholes. And as much as possible, you try to address them and pick them one by one, you know. So um, it's, 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 it's a difficult one, but it's really, really very doable. And um, once we're able to look inwards and um, address some of these areas that I have highlighted, I think we're going to make progress. Let, let's talk, touch on another area which we have not really explored, and it's the other side of this conversation. Yes, there are those who say test, 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 and there are others who say, well, why test if we're taking the appropriate precautions? There are states in Nigeria that have tested just between one and ten samples, at least as at the last figures that the NCDC released, and a lot of people are wondering, just 10, just seven, just one? It's quite shocking. So people are saying that maybe we should have an aggregation of these ideas. Let's come up and say, this is why I'm doing this, and this is how it is working for me. So uh, as, as a public health professional, how important is, is it to aggregate some of these ideas? They might seem extreme, but how important is it to bring these ideas to the table and try to trash them out one by one? Yeah, um, that's why we have the experts out there. There's a technical working committee of, for the, um, uh, the presidential tax force. They have a team of experts uh, whose um, responsibility primarily should be to be uh, doing a review of the system and assessing the condition, on, in fact, on daily basis to find out the areas that really need to you know, um, be addressed and um, try as much as possible to build up on that. But as you rightly pointed out, um, no matter what we're doing, we know that testing is very important. But what I can tell you is equally as important is ensuring that everybody is carried out. You know, this health education is very, very key, ensuring that there's compliance. So that even from within, we don't keep on uh, escalating the disease, its transmission, and just be grabbing and struggling with testing to catch up with. If we're sure that those who, are, and all these things should be happening simultaneously. So those who are out there to massively educate the public, guide them towards ensuring that we all abide by the, um, the rules of the games that will help in prevention of the transmission. While this is going on, an effort on the other side, to the best of our abilities, is put into testing. That is how we're going to achieve good results, you know. Um, but when you are there, you know that you have deficiencies already. And even the simplest means of curtailing the transmission, which is compliance by the people, unfortunately, you realize that even some educated people that we thought should know better are not carrying out this message correctly and rightly how it should be. And the society looks at some people as role models. So when such people deviate from the norm, the expectation, they start counting doubts whether we're making progress or not. So um, that is what I will say for now. Uh, the experts are there, the team, the technical working committee are there. So they should be very, very alive to their responsibilities, which I believe they are, by doing a, you know, a repeated evaluation of the system and identifying the problems and looking at areas you know, that they can deploy and put in much more effort in order to get um, sustainable and uh, more, more realistic results, you know. All right, then, Professor Taito Sibekwe, we do thank you very much indeed for talking to us this morning. All right, then. Okay, so we will be back in just a moment. We'll turn our attention to another matter. This one is something the president did sign not long ago, so stay with us.
All right, welcome back. Well, we've got uh, two senior advocates of Nigeria. First is uh, Mr. Babatunde Ajibade, SAN. We also do have uh, Mr. Ebunlu Adiburua, SAN, both of them joining us uh, this morning. Mr. Ajibade, thank you very much indeed for joining us today on the program. Let's start off with you. Now, the president's signing of this executive order 10 of 2020, which is meant to grant financial autonomy to state judiciary and the legislature. Mixed feelings, well, some, of course, there will always be different perspectives from lawyers. Let's get yours first. How, is this a good development from your perspective? Uh, <clears throat> morning, morning, gentlemen. Um, yes, definitely, I think it's, uh, it's a good development. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to, to read the the exact wording of the of the order, um, but in, in terms of you know conceptually, the whole idea uh, that is ingrained in the constitution is that the arms of government should, to the greatest extent possible, um, be independent of each other uh, and should act as a check and balance on each other. So, uh, I think any steps that are taken to ensure that the arms of, of government do have uh, financial autonomy uh, is, is, is a positive one. So I think it's a good development. Mm, yes, much as uh, that's uh, the perspective from you, but we have some lawyers who have raised some issues about uh, some section of the law. Now, some of the questions that they pose is that uh, whether Section 5 of the 1999 Constitution as amended empowers the president to modify the provisions of section 121, uh, 1 to 3 of the same constitution? Well, my, my reading of it is not that it's a modification. I mean, section 5 gives the president the, the power to implement um, all aspects of the constitution. Uh, as I said, I haven't had the opportunity. I've tried to lay my hands on the the executive order to read its precise wording. But from what has been reported in the press, it doesn't appear to me that this is, that there's any efforts to modify uh, the provisions of section 121. What I understand is that the president by this executive order is seeking to implement um, section 121. I know he's seeking to implement it to the extent that the states don't um, voluntarily um, do that which the constitution uh, says that they should do in terms of uh, financial autonomy for the other two arms uh, of government at state level. I, I think the only question that arises in my mind, actually, maybe not the only one, but a question that arises in my mind is, is whether the federal government has itself uh, done that which it is asking uh, the states to do. Uh, in terms of granting full financial autonomy to, to the judiciary uh, and the National Assembly at federal level. You know, those are big questions you raised there, and maybe we'll look into them, but still talking about this executive order. Now, how far-reaching is it, really? Because some say this can be contested, some say it has no, you know, no legislation force, and they say, well, this is just an executive order. So just maybe state governors might overlook it and still continue with business as usual. So how enforceable, if I may use that term, is this executive order? Well, you know, unfortunately for us, we're, we're still at a stage where our economy is um, uh, based on the principle of uh, allocation rather than on the principle of uh, generation. So to the extent that our states still, at least the majority of them, are still totally reliant almost on the allocation they get from the center. Um, clearly, I think that the federal government has the capacity to implement that which the president has, um, has announced uh, in the executive order. Now, can it be challenged? Of course, that is why the judiciary is there. Um, and if any of the states, either individually or, or collectively, feel that the executive order is unconstitutional, then of course they're entitled to, to challenge it. 
So you, you think that this is maybe just a stopgap measure because some are saying this should be widened, there should be some form of legislation to back this up. I, I don't think that this is a matter that requires legislation. I, I think, you know, and, and this 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 ties into another debate. I don't want us. I don't want to take us off of the subject of today. But it tie, it ties us into another debate that is raging in the legal community about the constitutionality of um, of virtual hearings. We can't seek to legislate on everything. You know, we we must be able to presume that we're all working uh, to achieve a positive result in governance. And if that is the case, um, it can't be the case that um, every time government wants to achieve something, um, it must legislate. The different arms of government and even the different uh, levels of government, be they federal, state or local government, ought to be able to come together uh, to achieve a common objective, which is good governance. So if, as I said right at the beginning, if the, the underlying uh, basis for our constitutional arrangement is that there should be separation of powers and that the various arms of government should act to check and balance on each other, then I really don't see why we would need to legislate for this. I think what the president is trying to do is already inherent in what is stated in our constitution. If it has not been implemented to date, which to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't, at least not fully, I don't see anything wrong with um, an effort to make it work. I mean, there's a lot of devil in the detail. I, I, I don't know that the executive order uh, goes far enough to uh, set out exactly how you know, this would work in terms of budgeting uh, and allocation, because... Uh, the constitutional provisions that say that, you know, the, the judiciary, uh, the legislature should receive the funds uh, that are allocated to them in the budget uh, does not necessarily take into consideration the manner in which uh, government uh, funding uh, accrues. But we must, I think, operate on the basis that the intent behind that constitutional provision is to ensure that one arm of government is not dependent on the other and does not have to go cap in hand every time it needs um, to expend resources. So we should work out the detail. Um, I don't think it requires uh, legislation. I think what it requires is collaboration. Okay, Mr. Adeguerua, what do you think? What's your impression of this? I mean, the, those who believe that, look, this is something that uh, the states, the country actually needs. What's your perspective? Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. I join my colleagues. I join activists. I join all nationalists to commend the president for this courageous, selfless, and patriotic move that he has made to actualize true federalism, to actualize restructuring, which we have been agitating for over the years. You know, before now, we've talked about how to run the country as a true federation, whereby there's independence, whereby there's separation of powers between the three arms of the government, as opposed to what the military had imposed on us by running the country as a unitary system of government. So, you know, actions were taken uh, by Nigerians. You recall that Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria, Jusun, went on strike and lock up the courts to agitate for autonomy uh, uh, for the judiciary. And indeed, the former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, uh, Dr. Lisa Bakuba, filed a case at the Federal High Court in Abuja and secured judgment directing that the money meant for the judiciary should be paid directly to the judiciary. But nothing was done. The courts have to go cap in hand to beg the executive for their form. And you know he who pays the paper we call the tune. So the agitations continue. And the uh, Houses of Assembly of the states worked together with the National Assembly in 2017. And they passed a bill called State Legislatures and Judiciary's Financial Autonomy uh, Alteration of the Constitution. And this bill was assented to by the president in June 2018. And what is the purpose of that law? That law 
amended section 121 sub 3 of the constitution by saying that every form that is meant for the legislature of the state, every form that is meant for the judiciary of the state should be paid directly to the account of the legislature and the account of the court since June 2018. But the governors of the state refused to abide by the provisions of this law, which is an enforceable law in Nigeria. And they continue to dominate and oppress the judiciary by refusing to release their funds until the president then set up a committee headed by the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation and then Senator Etai Inang, as he then was. And they came up with very robust recommendations. The president of the Nigerian Bar Association was there, members of JUSUN were there, parliamentary staff union were there, all stakeholders were represented in that committee. And they all came out with a suggestion that there should be an executive order to implement the provisions of section 121 sub 3 as amended by the fourth alteration. And that's what the president has done by signing executive order number 10 of 2020. And what has the president Just done? Just jump in. Major thing okay, before those three major context. things, before that, uh, if I could pick up on that particular section which you spoke about, we speak about. Now, there are some who say, well, yes, much as ideally would they like to see this play, them, play itself, I, it would be eventually good for the country if we achieve this. But they raise the point that the same Section 5 of the Constitution vests executive powers on the president. But it then says that uh, that same section vests powers for the state under the state executives, and that the president doesn't actually have that powers to override those of the state executives by this pronouncement. What's your interpretation of that? There is a misconception, Chamberlain, and I will point out that misconception. What the president has done has nothing to do with eroding the powers of the governors of the states. The president addressed the people that are under him. Number one, the accountant general of the federation. The president, by the executive order number 10 of 2020, gave a directive to the accountant general and said, from now on, from the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the Federation, any money standing to the credit of the legislature of the state and the judiciary of the state, pay directly to them. Ask them to nominate a bank account and give them the money from the federal allocation, from source. It has nothing to do with the powers of the executive. The governor has no power to appropriate money meant for the legislature. The governor has no power to appropriate money meant for the judiciary. So what the president has done has nothing to do with the powers of the governors. He only addressed the accountant general. And then he then also addressed the honorable attorney general and said, from now on, continue to issue directives to the accountant general, such as we ensure the implementation of the fourth rotation of the constitution. Look, we're tired of this uh, grant standing by the governors with all due respect to them. How do you see it as an executive in your office? and be the one to be detecting how much will be released to the judiciary. How does that work in a, in a federation? Go to the courts. They have been staff of form. The judges have no independence because they depend on the executive governors to release form to them. And you can imagine what is going on in the various states. Even when budgets capture capital projects for the judiciary, the chief justice has to go and be begging the accountant general of the state she has to go and be begging the attorney general of the state to release one to them. How Lula, do you get just, to just one moment. Regard? Just just one moment. Um, if this was always, I mean, you just talked about it that this the amendment you know took place in 2017, and up till the president signed this executive order, that law had not been obeyed. A constitutional provision was not obeyed by chief executives of states from what you are saying. So if that has been going on for so long, how come no one has taken this up? How come the judiciary themselves have not spoken up? How come the houses of assembly themselves have not raised any eyebrows about this? No, uh, uh, Ayo, honestly, I, I can tell you what is going on in the state. The governors, with all due respect to them, cannot claim to be Democrats if they are opposing the executive Order number 10 of 2020. Because 
this is an opportunity for us to practice true federalism. In the national... That, that, the question, Mr. Rigura, the question is not whether or not uh, the executive order is in place. The question here is, if there is a law, a pro constitutional provision, was, and everyone was duty-bound, swore on oath, to obey the constitution, how come the executive order is necessary if the constitution already said what the, constitution, what the executive order is saying? Hey, yes, this is the reason why the executive order is necessary. In all the states of the Federation, where the governors have control, there is no single uh, House of Assembly of any state that can assert any authority. Any speaker that rises up against any governor will be removed that same day. The governors have pocketed all the House of Assembly of the states. They don't have independence. They don't have a voice. That's the reason why you have not had their voices since the uh, period when this law had been amended. And any chief judge in any state that dares to confront a governor to demand for autonomy, that chief judge will be removed. You remember what happened in Cross River states. You remember what happened in Benue states. The governors are a law unto themselves, such that in the states where they have sway, nobody can stand up to any governor to assert independence. That's the reason why since 2018, when this law was passed by the National Assembly, it could not be enforced because the governors are sitting on the law. And that's why we must commend the president for his courage, because it is rare for you to get the head of the executive to say, I want the other arm of government to be independent. I have nothing to hide. I have no skeleton. If I've done anything wrong, go to court and challenge me. That's what the president is saying. I will Let commend him. For this let's take this, for this, let's take this to Mr. Ajibade now. Um, th this, this same issue that's... Uh, is actually quite interesting because, you know, on, over a number of times we've had to raise this same issue with some judicial officers, you know, just such as yourself, lawyers, legal practitioners and all uh, like that, asking the same question of why is it that maybe the MBA, for instance, or haven't been able to take this up and say, you know what, let us Put this, let's nip this issue in the bud. There is a law, the constitution has been amended to give financial autonomy to the legislature and the judiciary, the governors of each state swore an oath to obey the constitution, to govern by the constitution. How come no one has been able to take them up and say, guys, you're not doing what you, you promised you would do? Well, again, you know, and I, I commend my my brother uh, uh, Abu for his um, uh, passionate commendation of, of Mr. President, uh, and I, and I agree with him. But then he also drew your attention to the fact that something had been done uh, in the past. Uh, past president of the NBA, Dr. Isaac Bakova, had gone to court yeah, even before the constitutional uh, 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 alteration to seek enforcement of the provisions of the constitution relating to financial autonomy, at least for the judiciary, it didn't deal with the legislature. And that judgment was delivered, uh, in, 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 you know, it was delivered in his favor. But, you know, the, the challenge I think that the judiciary has, um, and I'm glad you mentioned the MBA, the challenge the judiciary has is that judges cannot be seen uh, to, to agitate um, remember, the cases that will need to be decided to resolve issues still come before these same judges. And they are, by virtue of their office, expected to maintain at all times uh, uh, a semblance of, of neutrality so that they're not seen to have prejudged issues. So I, I think the onus is on uh, the other members of the, of the profession, uh, of the legal profession, because judges, after all, were lawyers before they became judges. So the onus is on us at the bar, uh, I think, to, to take this, these issues up uh, and seek to enforce them. But again, you, you know, as um, uh, Ebon has said, what the president has done now is to try to force the hands of, of the, the state governors because the provisions of the constitution are clear. And if the state governors will not uh, implement what is contained in those uh, provisions willingly, then the, the federal executive, of, of course, has the power uh, to compel them to do this by making these um, uh, deductions at source. 
But all, all I would add, though, to that, and uh, which is what I said about the need for this to be dealt with in a collaborative manner, is that at the end of the day, um, I can't be, uh, say a situation where you can arrive at the destination we want to arrive at without a degree of collaboration between the arms of government, whether at federal or at state level. I mean, because I even for the, the uh, state judiciaries, uh, and the, the state uh, legislatures to ascertain or determine what they are entitled to. There has to have been a budgeting process. And that budgeting process is going to require collaboration between the three arms of government. No, no arm of government can suddenly write itself uh, a check and say, you know, this is how much I want. And therefore, you know, once, once there's money in the in the in the uh, state's consolidated revenue account, you must issue a check to that amount for me. The, the three arms of government must work together uh, to agree on on what uh, the 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 two arms, apart from the implementing arm, which is the executive, the other two arms are entitled to. And then, of course, once that agreement has been reached, and depending on how funds accrue, the executive, the state executives, must allocate and pay to the other arms what they're entitled to within that budget. And it shouldn't be the case that any other arm of government has to go cap in hand uh, to, to, to beg to be funded. I mean, I, I've seen, uh, and I'll give you a practical example of what um, uh, my friend Ebu was talking about. I, I've been to see uh, with a client to see an executive governor in one of the states in the Southwest where in, in his waiting room, when we got to his waiting room, the chief judge of the state was sitting there. We met the chief judge of the state there, and we left him because the executive governor asked that we be put in, you know, while the chief judge was still waiting. And I felt that this was an aberration. I mean, why should the chief judge of the state, uh, the, the, the head of a, an arm of government, be sitting in the waiting room of another, the head of another arm of government, uh, you know, as as just a guest, there isn't sufficient um, uh, uh, respect, I think, uh, between the arms of government. So to that extent, I agree with everyone that what the, the president uh, uh, is trying to do or has tried to do with this executive order uh, is a positive thing. But I still think that it has to be the objective has to be achieved uh, with some degree of collaboration. Sajib, if I could just jump in before we go to break in a minute or less. Now, speaking about that sufficient respect, does that also speak to the point where it's been raised several times, the way judges are appointed? Yeah, are you referring to me? Mr. Jibade, can you hear me? Hello? I, I was, Hello? I'm going to... Uh, Is that question to me or to... Yes, Reverend? it's to you, sir. Okay. So I, I think I think definitely it it, it does. Um, you know, again, you touch on a on a on a sensitive point that affects uh, our profession. It, it definitely does because you know, no matter how good your rules are, no matter how good your legislation is, no matter how good your constitution is, these things have to be implemented by human beings, and judges, after all, are human beings. So if in the process uh, of appointment of judges, you find that their independence has already been eroded because the process by which they came to be judges was itself not an objective process. It was a process that was unduly influenced by the executive. Then, you know, we're talking about financial independence. But financial independence then becomes secondary if, as a judicial officer, you're already, you're already beholden uh, to a political office holder because. It was the one that made your your uh, uh, becoming a judge possible. So I, I, I agree with you entirely that that in itself uh, is a challenge. And it's a challenge that um, uh, I think that the, the profession must face head on. Uh, again, right. there's, there's an ongoing um, uh, controversy uh, okay. which touches on P this. Pardon me to jump uh, in here, but we'll come back to you, gentlemen. Uh, and of course, maybe we'll start from you as well when we do return in just a moment. Please stay with us.
Welcome back, Mr. Jebede. Could you please go ahead and conclude your thoughts about the way judges are appointed? Yes, um, I was saying that the the independence of the judiciary requires much more than just financial autonomy. Um, just going back to your specific question, I agree with you entirely that the process by which judges are appointed is really the the, the base the base point for their for their independence, uh, and a lot more needs to be done to ensure that that process is transparent. Uh, and to ensure that you know judicial office officers are appointed based on their merit, based on their capacity, and based most importantly on their integrity, um, I, I think those are those are uh, basic requirements that we must uh, seek to 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 uh, enforce to ensure that when they do get into office, um, they will be able to actually exercise that that independence uh, that we all seek to have in our in our judiciary. So let me bring in Mr. Deborua now. It seems the more we unravel these things, the more we find out some, you know, issues that need to be sorted out. Yes, this has been put out by the president, but you see, we mentioned the way judges are appointed. And then there's that challenge of budgeting. Yes, a, a particular amount can be budgeted, but you, you realize that most times the funds are not released because they say, well, there's paucity of funds. So you wonder how that solves the challenge also. And we recall the LG issue, the local government, financial autonomy for local governments, almost the same thing. We know what has happened so far. So it seems there are a lot of challenges that need to be resolved. This executive order is coming first. What should follow. We know that there is a need to ensure that the state legislature and judiciaries are independent, but what should follow such that we don't go back to the issues we had with the local government and just say, well, it seems we cannot really solve this. Well, thank what? you very much. Uh, I believe that beyond financial autonomy, the executive order also made provision that in the coming three years, of coming into force of executive order number 10 of 2020, extraordinary special allocations will be made in the budget of the states to enable the cuts and back up on capital projects in all the various areas covered. But beyond that, as uh, Dr. Jibadi has said, uh, Dr. Jibadi has said, you cannot give autonomy with one hand and withdraw it with another hand. In the various MBAs, uh, government agencies, disobedience of orders of courts have threatened the existence of the judiciary. And there's no amount of wealth or money that you can throw at the courts without their honor, without their integrity in terms of obedience to judgments and orders issued by the courts. So I think the president also needs to look into that area to ensure that nobody in this country is able to sit in his office and then determine whether or not to obey the judgment of a court. Because when you do that, no amount of money in the hands of the judge will equate to the independence he has when his orders are obeyed. That's two. Number three, which is very important. There is a provision in the Sheriff and Civil Process Act of our country which was a law enacted by the colonialists to protect themselves. That law says that if you take government to court and you win the case, maybe you are asking for 10 million naira, and you went through trial, the government was represented, and you won the case, and the judge asked that the government should pay 10 million naira. That law says that that money will not be paid unless you get the approval of the attorney general to be able to provide the payment Pardon me, I, I, I need to jump in and ask you this question in conclusion because we need to wrap up soon. So, uh, shed some light on this for us. And in, in consideration of Section 162, does the Accountant General have powers to uh, deduct those monies for states meant to serve the state structure? Well, I believe that when you talk about allocation of funds, the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the states is determined on three levels. One going to the executive, one going to the judiciary, one going to the legislature. And Chamberlain, follow me to the National Assembly. There is a National Assembly Commission that collects the allocation of the National Assembly directly from source. There is a National Judicial Council 
that takes care of the revenue of the federal judges from source. Why is it different from the states? Why must the executive collect allocation meant for the judiciary in the states? Why can't you replicate what happens in national, in respect of the states? Why must you be the one to determine what kind of car a judge should buy? Why okay. must you be the governor that will determine what kind of house a judge should live All in? Right. Mr. Bro, we, we, we get your point. Uh, I'm afraid we need to go. It's, it's automated. So, but we do thank you, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Ebonlu Adegburoa, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and Mr. Ajebade, also an ICN. Thank you both for talking to us today on the program. Well, now, it's not all. Maybe we should just get a little bit of a uh, backstory to this. Are you? Yes, um, uh, we have a governance and policy consultant uh, in the person of John Mutu. He joins us from our uh, studio. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, give us a backstory to this executive order signed by the president. We understand that you've been at this for a while. Is it the same story since about uh, 10 years ago? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chamberlain, and uh, my friend, thank you so much for the opportunity for me to be here to share my thoughts on this very important uh, discussion. Um, uh, let me also start by thanking Mr. President, because this is the best salary gift he could have given to Nigerians, and I thank him for his courage, because like you rightly noted, this is uh, an issue that has been bogging the minds of Nigerians for quite some time. And uh, by way of background, if you remember, in the third, during the third alteration, the National Assembly made provision for financial autonomy, both for the federal legislature, the state legislature, and that of the federal judiciary and the state uh, judiciary. Unfortunately, the state legislature, when they were to uh, confirm or affirm that provision, inadvertently approved that of the federal legislature and that of the judiciary and voted against their own autonomy. But fortunately, in 2011, during the uh, Eighth Assembly, the National Assembly took that up once again. And at the end of the day, uh, the president did not uh, assent to that uh, alteration. But the, ninth, uh, the Eighth Assembly, at the end of the day, took that up. And uh, fortunately for Nigerians, that alteration sailed through after a series of uh, consultations. But like uh, the two gentlemen mentioned, the president assented to that uh, uh, amendment, specifically to section 12213 of the 1999 constitution in specifically May 23rd, uh, 2018. And between that and now, the state government were expected, the governors were expected to implement that provision, but unfortunately, uh, due to one reason or the other, they've not been able to do that. But let me also say that a lot of consultations has been going on between the conference of speakers and the state governors. I'm aware that sometime last year, a technical, joint technical committee was set up between the governors and the state house of assembly to agree on the implementation modalities but not much progress was made in that regard. I'm also aware that as critical stakeholders, including the Friends of Democracy and all other well-meaning Nigerians have been engaging at different levels. And an SOS was sent to Mr. President because according to section uh, five of the 1999 constitution, like rightly uh, paint, uh, pointed, uh, section one B grants the president the power and the responsibility to maintain the uh, uh, observance of the 1999 constitution. So if a constitutional provision has been made, every stakeholder in the country, including governors, have a responsibility to comply. And once there is non-compliance, Mr. President has a responsibility to enforce that. So the executive order number 10 that was signed by Mr. President simply, simply, not, is not granting autonomy because the constitution has already granted autonomy, but it's only providing an implementation framework for state governors and other stakeholders to comply with that provision. And you, I know- Just one moment, up, just, just, just one moment, um, Mr. Mutu. The, you, you, you said that they, to a large extent, this conversation has been going on for a while. And um, it, it'll be nice to understand what are the, the What's, what's the undertone? Why the delay? Why they, well, you also mentioned something the other time that the state assemblies themselves were not very open to agreeing to their own autonomy. 
from your findings, if any, what did you discover was the reason for that, um, uh, for that position that they took at the time? Uh, two issues. One was that most of them didn't even understand the implications of that provision or that amendment. They were highly, held. a lot of them were not informed and there was limited consultation between the National Assembly and the State Assembly on the essence or the rationale behind that amendment. So there was limited consultation. So when the amendment got to the State Assemblies, most of them didn't really understand. The second part of it was that the president also, due to their overbearing, the, sorry, the state governors, due to their overbearing influence on the, state, on the State House of Assembly, impressed upon them in fact, I want to say who'd wing them from, ascent, uh, from uh, 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 agreeing to that alteration. The same situation happened in the, during the, the, the last alteration. It took a lot of persuasion. It took a lot of consultation. It took a lot of discussion for this state house of assembly to understand what it meant. And maybe at the end of the day, they all agreed to, 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 to that alteration. But you must also remember for any amendment to scale through, you require at least 24 state house of assembly endorsing that alteration. In the last exercise, there were about one, they got about 23, they were shot by one. But this time around, they overwhelmingly voted in favor of that alteration. So the other issue, oh, yes. Okay, just a moment. Let, the I other need to, issue was, okay. If, if you can hear me, I just need to get some clarity. Yes, this looks like autonomy, but then on the other hand, some people will say, this is just a way of removing state executives as middlemen in quotes, such that the power is now mainly at the center. So don't you think while this is given some form of autonomy uh, to the state's judiciary and legislature, is also given more power to the federal structure? Uh, I don't think that is uh, correct. The, what the president has simply done is that there should be all institutions of governance, all arms of government should be equal as envisaged by the framers of the 1999 constitution. We practice a presidential system of government where we have three arms, the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. And based on the principle of separation of powers, these three arms of government must be able to check and balance each other, providing oversight over each other. But as we have today, we have a very, very powerful executive arm and very weak uh, uh, judicial and uh, legislative arm, thereby defeating the whole essence of uh, separation of powers. So what the current uh, amendment has simply done is to say that these three arms of government, because funding is critical to the survival of any institution, is only saying that these three arms of government should have direct access to funding at the federal and at the state level. At the federal level, the National Assembly and the federal judiciary has already enjoying this financial. And that is why you can see some level of uh, uh, checks and balances at the federal level. The National Assembly can stand up today and challenge the executive on points of law and governance. But at the state level, like has been pointed out earlier, the, both the judiciary, the state judiciary and the state legislature go to the executive cap in hand. And you can see uh, speakers going to the state, uh, uh, state governors waiting in the waiting room for up to nine hours with files seeking for resources. So it has nothing so, to do with the balance of power between the federal and the state level. Rather, it's more of an horizontal uh, 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 um, balancing. Uh, so Mr. in Mutu, this case, the executive just, of, just add to this while you're also uh, in conclusion of your comments. Add to this, stretch it for us. Now, when this is operationalized, what do we expect to see? Okay, what you will see is that you will see a very, very vibrant legislature at the state level. You also see an independent legislature that is able to provide oversight over, executive, over the executive arm, is also able to ask the hard questions of the generation and the utilization of public funds, is also able to check the excesses of the executive. In some way, the judiciary, high court judges will be able to dispense justice without fear or favor. Because most of the cases at the uh, state high courts are borders on, right? But, but Mr. Implementation Mr. of state policies, which the executive. You know, but the thing about this is this. Much as that's the way it's supposed to play out, how are they going to do that if the state executive or the governor is the one that appended the signature for the judge to be appointed? 
Okay, I think let's separate the issues. There are different layers, and you can't resolve all the issues one day. I agree that is a big challenge, but maybe what we should do is to take one at a time. Appointment of judges is one issue. Independence, because it's also one of the critical uh, uh, determinants of the level of independence of appointment is one critical issue. But what we have done so far, based on the amendment that is on the table, is that of providing administrative and financial independence across the tiers of government. Maybe when this is done, another level of advocacy could be around the electoral process, how members of the legislature are elected, what is the recruitment process, what is the influence the governors have over them. Same way we'll be looking at the issue of the independence of the, ju uh, the, the judiciary when governors are the ones that append. The same thing at the federal level also. It's a separate issue of advocacy or reform that we can be taking for. But at the moment, what is on the table is how can we ensure that the legislature and the judiciary have access to fund without depending on the mood of the governor. If the governor is happy today, he releases. And if he's not happy today, he does not. That is an aberration. And what the ex president has simply done, and remember, the executive order is not at this moment saying expressly that money should be deducted at source. It only says in the event that any state government refused, governor refused to comply with the provisions of the constitution, it's giving power to the accountant general depending on the other issued by the attorney general for those funds provided in the budget of each state to be deducted at source on a pro rata basis. So give an example, if the budget of the legislature and the state level is 1 billion per annum, or 1.2 billion as the case may be per annum, if you prorate to over 12 months, it comes to 100 million per month. What is saying that the, executive, the governor or the accountant general of each state, once money comes into there, is supposed to transfer that 100 million to the account of the, sta of the, of the state assembly and the heads of the courts of the judicial, the respective courts for them to utilize and use for the purpose of their function. But the but thing about today, that... Once the budget is passed, mm. the governors now act as accountants or the treasurers, and the, executive, the legislature and the judiciary go cap in hand every day to ask for the release of you know, those funds. The thing about that, briefly, is the fact that the funds are not usually available all the time. So, I mean, this can be quite tricky if the judiciary says, well, we need to get our one billion. We don't really care if there is money available or not. That, that's quite tricky. But on a final note, it will seem as though, you know, the governors are the ones taking the fall in this whole conversation. And it begs the question, I think everybody would agree that there is a need for that independence. So why does it seem as though state executives are holding on to this? Because the truth is this, they can still find other ways to frustrate the judiciary if they really want to. So why do you think state executives seem to be holding on to this? Uh, I want to believe that uh, why they've not been able to implement this. And let me also say that it's not all the states. Out of the 36 states, six of them, about five of them, uh, have started implementing this. Delta is one of those states. Uh, Quara is another state. Jigawa is one. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, Bayesa State has started implementation of this, and Ebony states have started implementation. It's a consultation that has been ongoing. And when in our conversation with some of the governors, they were also saying that how is the implementation going to be done? There was confusion, just like you said. When there is no sufficient fund, we'll, and the other arms of government insist on getting their full money, what do we do in that circumstance? So what I would be proposing is that, and in our conversation, speakers on the House of Assembly also agree, that once there is a revenue shortfall, based on the tripartite consultation between the three arms of government. An agreement will be reached on a monthly basis. What is the level of shortfall? Is it 10%, is it 20%? And that 20% will be cut across board. But it's not for just the governor sitting down to determine so or more to what to give to each arm of government based on his own uh, 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 desire. It should be based on the product of amount. Nobody is saying that it must, the monies must be given 100% to the legislature or to the judiciary once there is a shortfall. All right, then, Mr. John Mutu, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts there. Well, back in a moment, we'll take a look at some of your responses. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Well, some uh, messages uh, concerning some of the matters we've discussed. This one comes in from uh, Onoja, says, 
it does not matter how long we discuss or, or we discuss on the strength of language we use, as long as corruption in the management of government affairs is not eliminated in Nigeria, we will only be moving in circles and running a rat race. Well, let's take a look at this next one from Babajide uh, Akirami, talking about uh, an issue we discussed uh, much earlier. It says he has been to China twice, and both occasions he had to register at the nearest police station any time he was not residing in an hotel. It goes on to say he believes the Chinese government knew where he was in Guangdong and Pudong provinces every time. It says, he was asking the question that, why do we fail on so many fronts? Where is intelligence in our intelligence agencies? Where is the policing in our Nigerian police is it that hard to have a workflow and hold someone accountable? And by saying these accumulated failures, uh, showing the Nigerian government uh, goes on to make that claim. I but think he's talking about the know. Chinese yeah. whereabouts in Nigeria. Yeah. That question of who are they, where are they, and things like yeah. that. Which we talked about last week. Last week yeah. Yeah. This one from Anko Modu says, granting local government councils autonomy without allowing INEC to conduct all LG elections is useless. Local government bosses who are placed in offices through the manipulations of state electoral commissions will still be tied to the apron strings of their governors. Again, begs the question of uh, autonomy. Mm. And this one is from Professor Imonoka Enakena. Uh, and he says, PMB must ensure that the executive order is enforced to maintain the autonomy of the legislature. And the next in line should be local government autonomy. PMB must ensure the enforcement of the executive order. Question. <laughs> okay, we'll see what happens with that one. So there you go. That is the show today. Thank you all for watching. I'm Chamberlain So Have a happy holiday. Yeah, I'm Kairo Kikiolu. I'm Ayo Makinde. Please do stay safe. And I'm over you, so thank you so much for watching.